Press. Our political editor, Beth B is here with me. And uh, Beth's speculation about who's going to be in that cabinet. Well, if we look down the far end of the street and look at some of those supporters there, I can certainly see Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary. Now, he's not We've... turning up here to be sacked, is he? Well, we still expect him to be Defence Secretary. But I have to say, though, there are a lot of MPs down there, dozens of MPs. Uh, I think that is a bigger crowd uh, than Boris Johnson had this morning. But it's the symbolism of that, actually, uh, because this is a prime minister who did not win the support initially of the MPs. Rishi Sunak won with the parliamentary ballot. She, in the end, had slightly more back in than he did. But you would expect that because it was so nailed on that she would win. And then in terms of the vote from the members of the party, if the polls were right, her lead narrowed quite substantially over the course of the race between her and Rishi Sunak. In the end, she picked up 57%, he picked up 43%. It started out that she was at 66%, 67%. So you could argue, if the polling was right, that the more the party saw of her, the less sure they were for her to be Prime Minister. So I think that part of having all of those MPs there to come and cheer her will be to try and show that this is a united Conservative Party uh, that it is moving on and it's getting on with the task. And when she gave that very short speech yesterday, acceptance speech, it was deliver, deliver, deliver. And in terms of what Adam was saying about will she change the tone as she addresses the nation, I spoke to one of her key allies uh, last night and I said, what's the speech going to be like? Is it going to be different? And this person said to me, I think it'll be pretty much what she said yesterday. She is consistent in her message. She doesn't wax and wane, if you like. So let's see if, if it's about delivery, delivery, delivery is the sort of mantra that she wanted to get across. And why? Because there was a sense, wasn't there, amongst MPs of the frustration at the lack of delivery uh, from the Johnson uh, government in the last months, that it was so embroiled with the scandals of some of the behaviours within Downing Street that it just wasn't getting on with the job of governing the country. So the whole mantra will be delivery. And I can just see Dermot um, behind us, uh, just down the street. Nadim Zahawi has now come out. Uh, he is the current Chancellor, could be going to Cabinet Office. He's just talking there to Ben Wallace. And I think I might be able to see James cleverly there. As Adam was saying, he is expected to be the Foreign Secretary. Suella Braverman expected to be the Home Secretary. Jacob Rees-Mogg is expected to be uh -huh. uh, the business secretary. You can see a trio of them Sahari, there. James uh, and there's Chris Heaton-Harris. Right. Now, he is a key uh, friend of Liz Truss, actually. They did a lot of work in, in the past uh, together on the back benches. Uh, and there's some talk that he might become uh, the Northern Ireland Secretary of State. There was talk that Sajid Javid, uh, the former health secretary, might take that job, but that doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, perhaps he, like Ian Duncan Smith, didn't want the role. Jacob Rees-Mogg, I can just see, uh, he's going to come home to your screen a bit in a moment. He's, he's coming up. And isn't that a big crowd of, of MPs there? You see Jacob yep. uh, just coming into shot there. Uh, Anne-Marie Trevelyan in the fuchsia uh, suit. Uh, yep. She is going to have a role. She's a former uh, trade secretary. Um, she will be expected to take a cabinet position as well. So they are all getting ready uh, to cheer on Liz Truss uh, when she arrives in Downing Street. And as I said, that is a pretty sizable group of MPs. You might almost forget that she only won support of 42% of her parliamentary party. That's 149 MPs out of 300. Well, quite a few more than during the course of the campaign. Then, yeah, she won more in. during the course of tell the me about, Tell me about... Um, the style and, and the way she delivers a speech. I mean, it's going to be quite a contrast with just nine hours ago. That is quite an act to follow in terms of Boris Johnson, you know, jokes about being a, a rocket booster, hopping around on a space hopper. Dylan the dog was in there, Larry the cat, ancient Roman statesman. That's not Liz Truss's it's not style. Liz Truss. It's not Liz Truss's style. And actually, it was interesting, wasn't it, that during the hustings, she actually turned some of her sometimes slightly jilted performances slightly um, into an advantage, if you like. She, she played into it. She said, I'm not a slick performer, but what you see is what you get taking a dig, if you like, uh, at Rishi Sunak, who is a very good media performer and a very good communicator. Um, you know, Liz Truss isn't as slick as that. 
Uh, but she has improved, I think, tremendously uh, during the hustings in her delivery of speeches. But no, it's a very different style uh, to Boris Johnson. Uh, it's short, it's sharp, it's decisive. It, she sometimes shoots from the hip, though, and, and she can trip herself up. You saw that when she was foreign secretary and she talked about uh, foreign fighters going over to Ukraine mm -hmm. and she had to reverse uh, that position pretty quickly. Well, uh, that speech expected, uh, we thought, sometime between four and five o'clock, but we can work it out ourselves, watching the progress of her car and uh, the outriders and the police support and her team. It's making pretty slow progress, in actual fact, through London, still to the west of London. We understand those of you that know the geography, somewhere just past Shepherd's Bush. So do the math, still a way to go. It's 20 to five, uh, that speech perhaps not taking place for the next half an hour or so. We'll have it all for you live. Do you want to miss a thing right here on Sky News? So the, the cars, we think, are going to start arriving fairly shortly. But um, once she's in place, then that speech will take place. Bess, hearing something? Well, I, the thing I was going to say to you is I, I think she is going to be arriving quite shortly, and that's why everyone's gathering. But I think also what we're going to see is quite a rapid cabinet. You know, sometimes it goes on for hours because someone goes in, mm -hmm. the negotiation doesn't work, uh, and they take a while, and then it all falls apart, and it can go on for hours and hours. This time, the cabinet, I think, is nailed on. I think it's all been sorted out. And I think that they will be perhaps walking up the street, but they're going to be in and out pretty quickly, and those announcements, I think, will be made pretty succinctly. Part of that, Dermot, uh, some of her team told me, was about trying to show that she is ready for business. She wants to get straight to it. She needs to get on with the job of trying to sort out uh, the energy crisis and give the public some reassurance because it has been an effective zombie government, hasn't it, for weeks with the Conservative Party, instead of dealing with these massive policy issues, uh, fighting a leadership contest. I should say too, though, Dermot, that Nadim Zahawi, uh, her chancellor that could go to run the cabinet office, um, and Kwasi Kwarteng, her business secretary that is expected to go and be chancellor, have been working up all the options. So the work for what this energy package might look like has been going on. But for the public, it's clearly been frustrating. You can look at recent polling. One poll uh, put the Conservatives 17 percentage points uh, behind Labour, and polls have regularly put them double digits behind. So in terms of the public view, they've taken quite a dim uh, view of what's been happening lately uh, in the Conservative Party uh, and in the Conservative government. Do you know what? Just to um, update people on the weather, I think uh, that lectern maybe going back inside Downing Street. It is just starting to, to rain here in Downing Street. Don't know how long this shower is going to last. We shall see. Let's uh, talk again to Adam Bolton, our former political editor, now political uh, commentator. And Adam, just picking up there on the, on the difference in style, and that's drift, and it was more than drift that we've had for, for two months. We are now going to see frenetic activity from government. Yes, I think we are, and we're also going to see uh, action on the international stage. Uh, it's noticeable that uh, the new Prime Minister has been receiving uh, messages of congratulation from other leaders, all of them very much uh, sort of holding out an olive branch. We've had one from the Irish, one from the French and others, although apparently someone called Liz Trussell, who has a uh, hashtag at Liz Truss, has been receiving a lot of messages from foreign leaders on Twitter as well, uh, because they think they're communicating with the Prime Minister, and they are. But, but she is uh, most likely going to be going to Dublin fairly soon. Uh, she is likely uh, to attend the United Nations General Assembly uh, in uh, mid-September. Now, there uh, would probably be her first meeting uh, with President Joe Biden, uh, maybe in a relatively brief brush by. I have to remember that uh, Boris Johnson, actually, while he was Prime Minister, only had one face-to-face -face meeting uh, with uh, Joe Biden. And uh, there is, uh, uh, later in the year, uh, an international summit in Bali as well of the G20. So, uh, I think... What we'll quite often see with a new leader is they will want to... The other foreign leaders and foreign diplomats will want to get her measure. 
Uh, they didn't really need to do that with Boris Johnson because uh, he was a familiar uh, national figure uh, by the time he became Prime Minister and indeed had already made uh, quite a lot of enemies uh, in Brussels in particular where he'd been a uh, correspondent for the Daily Telegraph. But Liz Truss, they are showing themselves at this stage to be uh, rather more open. And she has said uh, that she plans to take rather fewer uh, prime ministerial photo ops, uh, perhaps because she's been teased for the photo ops she's taken uh, during the campaign, that uh, she's going to make fewer visits, fewer uh, appearances on camera as prime minister uh, than her predecessor. That will be uh, very much a change in style. Uh, one thing I think we're seeing, uh, since we have to uh, spend so much time looking at the lecterns where the prime minister is speaking, are we seeing a new design of lectern with that sort of twirly spiral uh, design, which uh, she spoke at yesterday, a lectern like that, with the uh, union flag sort of uh, built into the sides. Uh, that uh, one today just seems to be pure wood, but quite often, uh, believe it or not, a lot of uh, thought goes into what sort of lectern the Prime Minister uh, should appear at. Perhaps we've seen it before. I certainly haven't seen one uh, with that spirally uh, uh, arrangement uh, previously, although we've got used to seeing uh, the Prime Ministerial uh, seal on uh, various lecterns of different kinds. Well, talking lecterns, Adam, I don't think I'll be uh, allowed to approach it and test out your theory that um, that's made of wood as well. I'm also thinking there's um, going to be a spare lectern erected somewhere inside Downey Street because it has started tipping down now, and I can't imagine the new Prime Minister will want to make her speech in a downpour. We'll see if that abates because we are told the thinking is that Liz Truss, the new Prime Minister, is 15 minutes away or so from number 10 Downing Street and uh, therefore we'll need a few minutes, I imagine, to greet her supporters before she makes that speech. Stay with us, though, right here on Sky News. We're staying live on it. You won't miss a thing uh, involving the journey and, of course, what Liz Truss is going to say herself. Our political editor, Beth Rigby, is here with me. And so much on her plate, Beth. I was interested in what you said hearing from her supporters earlier on that she is going to prioritise this phrase, sequencing. So we know, number one, there are things that we have been talking about that we're not talking about at the moment, but which are certain to come back. Mm. I'm talking first and foremost about the, the NHS. COVID hasn't gone away. Mm. The NHS is in difficulties anyway. And she's got this issue of funding. She apparently has pledged to take some money away from the NHS. I have to say, Dermot, and, and there's been such a focus on energy bills um, that this hasn't been discussed. But I was talking to Paul Johnson of the IFS. I have to say... A loud moan the, here the, as the, the sky is um, open. The skies have opened and Liz Truss's team... Uh, are all standing outside number 11 now, getting absolutely drenched. They do have brollies. Um, but you have to wonder whether Liz Truss uh, will uh, be doing the speech outside on the lectern. They've covered the lectern, actually, with a plastic bag, ever uh, oh, innovative uh, there. <laughs> I've lost my train of thought now. There's not an official uh, lectern cover. There's, we, there's we no were official talking, lectern we, cover. We, we, um, yeah, well, talking to Paul fitting. Johnson of the IFS about this, about budgets, yeah. because when the spending review set budgets for NHS and other public services and schools, inflation was predicted or running at 3%. So there will be an issue about spending in the NHS and schools over the autumn anyway, because uh, departments will be saying we need more money because inflation is eating up the budgets for schools and hospitals around the country. Just to give you some context about the pressure the NHS is under, one in eight Britons are now on waiting lists for appointments. One in eight. People can't get GP appointments. Ambulances are having record high waits. There's record high waits for a and &E. It's a huge problem. Now, the Liz Truss view is that you can make the NHS more efficient and then you can improve service. She's put in as I said, her key lieutenant and ally uh, and problem solver, if you like, of government uh, to raise coffee probably into the health brief, uh, putting someone she really trusts to try and fix that and putting Kwasi Kwarteng into the chancellorship 
and Jacob Rees-Mogg, another key ally, who agrees with her, I think, on economic principles uh, into the biz department to try and fix the two most pressing issues. I think the other issue that will be uh, key for her is immigration and the problem of small boats. And the Rwanda scheme, uh, which was meant to solve this problem, clearly hasn't got up and running. And in terms of what Adam was talking about, about looking at the European Convention of Human Rights and uh, some of those issues, how much will she press reform in order to try and drive through that immigration policy, uh, which we know is popular with Conservative voters. So, so watch for that as well. That could be a combination of Suella Braverman in the Home Office and another key ally, Brandon Lewis, who I think potentially will go to the Justice Department. Just staying with the economy and that very important point you make, Beth, about the effect of inflation. We've seen it already in terms of the industrial action, the strikes that have been taking place. Inflation predicted by some reputable economists to perhaps hit 20, 22%. That's eroding real wages. We yes. all know that. Those staff working in the NHS already under pressure. Nurses talking about going on strike. However much they get, it's not going to be enough to compensate for that. The rain beginning to really tip down. Again, the uh, impromptu, That's the makeshift cover going back on the lectern. But it all gives that sense, particularly the industrial action, the railways, the docks we've seen and more to come, that somehow the country isn't working. Britain is broken. The issue of inflation and the way it's eroding um, household incomes uh, is, and also wages is a key problem uh, this winter. And I think there will be issues. I'm just watching that actually. The lectern yeah. is, is being, it's being- Retreat, um, retreat. It's retreating. It's retreating, but actually, um, uh I have to say, Liz Truss's team is also uh, getting apps. It's absolutely throwing it down, isn't it? Uh, they're getting absolutely drenched. Uh, I would say, uh, Dermot, that the new Prime Minister will not want to give her an organ address in the pouring wet rain. It will be um, an analogy that she will not like. Certainly not. Well, you, you know, like a, like a bride at a wedding, perhaps she might make another circuit because these are short, sharp showers. Yeah, they are short, she, sharp showers. She uh, wouldn't really want to arrive in Downey Street and get out of the car in this. No, no, uh, she will absolutely will not want to do that. It's absolutely thrown it down. I mean, it is, um, it is really thrown it down. But going back to what you were saying about um, inflation, there is an issue about public sector pay, as we know, and not only does she have the issues of energy bills, of uh, funding, the NHS, of schools and all those pressures, um, she also has the issue of public sector pay and the threat of strike action, not just from transport workers that we've seen, but now we're seeing barristers go on strike, teachers are balloting, the NHS workers are balloting. Uh, you know, if Britain goes into a situation over the autumn into winter where public services are just shutting down because people are so fed up about um, these, these effective wage cuts because of so soaring inflation, that is another huge problem uh, for the Prime Minister. I mean, Dermot, the intray keeps... When you look at the intray, the problems just seem to be piling up. So you have to deal with them in order of importance, and that leads us right the way back to the issue of energy. Here's a thought for you, Beth. It has been mentioned before, but if it lands well, but the economic prospects, certainly the price of energy, looks like it's still going to continue rising. It's taking a huge amount of money to fund that. But if it lands well, what about an yes, early election, that, an election well, next year? The first thing I say, if it lands well, it buys her time and it could potentially hmm. give her a poll bounce. And you're right, at that point, does she decide to go for it? Uh, I should just tell you, um, her team are going in and I'm just hearing that Wish we uh, could. she will do the speech inside. So uh, all our supporters are there, but the rain is driving and uh, her team, uh, her number 11 team have just gone back in. And as I understand it, she's going to do uh, the speech inside, which is a shame because um, there's nothing better than seeing a prime minister outside number 10. She had her supporters ready uh, to come. Uh, but I think, can you see the MPs also now all dispersing um, a change of plan? Uh, it would not be um, what Liz Truss would want to give the inaugural speech in the driving rain. Uh, that is not um, 
the look. No, no certainly not. Want. So we're, we're expecting at this point, although, as I say, these are short and sharp, but just because this one stops doesn't mean to say another one isn't going to follow shortly after. So we're expecting that speech now to take place indoors as the reception committee rapidly disperse. And on the left-hand side of your screen, the uh, entourage, the Liz Truss convoy, makes its way rather slowly through some of the back streets of London to arrive here in Downing Street. Well, just a thought about the outgoing, or sorry, the gone Prime Minister, backbencher Boris Johnson. What do you think he's going to do? And uh, is he really going to be able to bite his lip for months to come? Well, he hasn't completely ruled out a return. Um, Eddie Lister, his former chief of staff and old ally, said never rule it out. Uh, but what he did say today was that he was going to go back to the back benches. He used more colourful language uh, than that, of course, um, and that he uh, will support Liz Truss. Look, there's lots of options for Boris Johnson. Uh, the first one, of course, will be to go on the speaker circuit where he uh, will no doubt command uh, huge sums of money to give speeches around the world. It's something that David Cameron and Theresa May did. Uh, also, will he return to write in a column in one of the big newspapers? He used to be, as you know, a, a, a Telegraph uh, columnist. Um, but he will still be... He feels hard feature. done by, though, doesn't he? I mean, he we heard it in that speech. They changed the rules midway, he said, and there's never been an admission from him of doing anything wrong. No, that speech um, was laced with recrimination and a sense of indignation, I think. There was no acknowledgement of any shortcomings, personal failings on the part of Boris Johnson um, that might have um, precipitated his own downfall. Uh, and he certainly felt that uh, he was hard done by, by his parliamentary party and he made that quite clear. Uh, there is some talk amongst some Boris Johnson supporters that uh, if it all goes terribly wrong with Liz Truss, may they, you know, try and get him back. But I think, you know, it's hard to see that now, although I've learned to predict nothing in politics, actually, <laughs> Dermot. Um, but for now, we'll go back to the benches and, and insist he'll be loyal to Liz Truss. And you, you should remember, too, that um, he was her, she was his choice. He didn't publicly say it. But the fact that his key allies fell in behind Liz Truss, um, the fact that the party membership, a core of whom were very loyal to him, fell in behind Liz Truss. He did help, if you like, um, determine the outcome of this um, contest between Rishi Sunak. One of Rishi Sunak's supporters during the contest said that um, Boris Johnson's support of Liz Truss had been the poison pill in Sunak's attempts to enter number 10. So he is loyal to her, but you know, you saw a slight division between them, didn't you, on the issue of fracking, when Liz Truss said that she would introduce fracking and then he made a speech uh, disagreeing with that. So uh, let's see, um, let's see uh, whether as time goes on, there are more splits between them. He, she won't want him to be disloyal to her on the back benches. I mean, every time uh, um, Theresa May did that to Boris Johnson, it was extremely unhelpful, but Liz Truss and Boris Johnson certainly have a better relationship than Theresa May and Boris Johnson. I should just say... She's though, getting closer. M now, much, much closer. I think now that's... Um, it's stopped raining again yeah. and some of the MPs are coming out. So, I don't know, maybe... It's like um, one of those clocks, isn't it? One of those Swiss clocks the, where you come in and out. Um, but as I say, there could be another shower following hard on the heels of this one. Yes, some... Um, Liz Truss like that, is, that is getting very shower, close. Though, that was a downfall, well, OK, it? but it was short, <laughs> short, sharp. Um... Just on Boris Johnson again, might, you know, might that option, I mean, he's going to remain as an MP uh, at the moment, might that option, though, be taken away from him because there is still that parliamentary committee looking yeah. into whether he misled Parliament. Now, if they find against him, that ultimately could cost him his seat, couldn't it? Yes, and there's been a big, there's been a big kind of pushback, hasn't there, in the final days of his premiership to try and push back against that inquiry to try and undermine the legitimacy of that inquiry. Um, but you are right that that is still a very live issue uh, for Boris Johnson. Of course, it has far less jeopardy when you're a backbench MP to when you're Prime Minister. And it is approaching five o'clock, and uh, let's use the word approaching. That's the embankment by the River Thames as Liz Truss is making her Who's way. And uh, yes, indeed, <laughs> the lecterns back out in out shake it all about. I wonder if they've. Uh, Shaking the, the rain off it, maybe got a 
bit of a better cover for it. They are going to, to make that speech. That it, it's a set piece, as you were saying, Beth. You, you want to see the prime minister there, the new prime minister. She may not have won a general election. She won an election. And they're all back out again. Do you think some of them have got two jackets in there? They're all still very dry. They're all back. They're all back. Therese Coffey has just come out. Uh, Wendy Morton there, another MP. I think she might become uh, the chief whip. She's out. Uh, and the uh, trust team are all back out. And they're in good spirits. They're a little bit drenched, actually, to be honest. Um, they didn't have as big um, they didn't have big Sky News umbrellas like we did. Uh, but all the MPs are back as well. And, and look, of course she wants to stand and face uh, the world's media. You can't see on the screens what we can see, but there are literally hundreds of cameramen, of cameras, of news organisation. The whole world is watching uh, this moment of uh, Liz Truss becoming the 56th Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and the third uh, female Prime Minister. All of them have been Conservatives, I should say, when it comes to electing a female as their leader. Interesting that, though, um, and to continue in that vein, because we do know, I mean, it would be a real shock if it's the top four, as we understand it, in Cabinet, Prime Minister, Foreign Secretary, Chancellor, Home Secretary, if they aren't who we think they are going to be, no white men, not a single white man amongst the top four. That is history. It is history, yeah. Um, and only a few years ago, when David Cameron was um, Prime Minister, there was a lot of talk about the lack of diversity at the top table and... Uh, the need for more female MPs in Parliament and the need for more female MPs in Cabinet. And yes, that is quite a change. Uh, and it is a big moment. Do you think that's going to be reflected then throughout Cabinet and throughout the ministerial ranks? I think the thing to look for with the ministerial ranks is how she tries to blend the party or whether she does or doesn't. That when Boris Johnson won in 2019... Every single person that had backed Jeremy Hunt was literally kicked out of government. His prime desire was slavish loyalty, uh, and he did not want anyone, even in ministerial positions, that were not 100% in Team Boris. And that is sort of part of the issue that bore grievances from him that simmered on the back benches and then began to blow up when things got tough for him. And I was really interested to see how she tries to blend her cabinet and her uh, ministerial team. Now, one of her allies said to me the other day, Liz Truss will want loyalty with key staff, with key cabinet positions. She'll need people that are signed up 100% to her agenda. But she also recognises there's an awful lot to do in the run-up to the next general election if she doesn't call one earlier than 2024 to try and win over a public that, quite frankly, at the moment are moving towards Labour in terms of voting intention. Okay, and Beth. she says they need competence and they need to be competent ministers. Just want to get to the imminent arrival because um, I'm familiar with that route more often, certainly not by helicopter, and more often on my bicycle on the, on the blue routes there. But um, she is just actually crossing away from Westminster, I think, to come in perhaps over Westminster Bridge. I think that's Lambeth Bridge. Um, coming... Certainly very close to Westminster. Yes, that is uh, Lambeth Bridge. She'll turn left there. Her entourage will turn left there. Uh, along a, a different side of the embankment, come back over Westminster Bridge and then uh, right into Whitehall and into Downing Street itself. Uh, three or four minutes away at the very least. Just mark our card before we hear it about that speech. Length, content. In terms of the length, the one yesterday was really short. I don't imagine that she will be speaking for a long time, but I think the content will be, I am here, I will deliver uh, for the country. The best days are ahead of us. That's something she's consistently said uh, when she was in the hustings. She will talk about energy. She will tell the public that she's heard them. Uh, she will talk about uh, the NHS, I suspect. She will basically try and touch on some of the issues that she knows she has to deal with that are the biggest pressures for her and perhaps people are most concerned about. The thing I don't know, and I'd be interested to hear, is what does she say about Boris Johnson? Because she used him. Like yesterday, uh, she praised him publicly to the party whilst completely ignoring uh, Rishi Sunak. 
but she praised her predecessor. Will she do that on the lectern to the nation or will she just quietly consign uh, the Boris Johnson era uh, to history and try and present herself as a new prime minister, a new, pri a new administration, a new era? Of course, it's a new administration, but the Conservatives have been in power for 12 years. And part of the more curious elements of listening to Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak uh, talk about the country in the past few weeks and policies and what's been right and what's gone wrong has been them almost disavowing uh, the record of previous Conservative Prime Ministers. So let's see what she says about Boris Johnson. She has to, in a way, create a sense of new momentum and freshness. Rather than uh, continuity. This... Because, of course, that is something, as you point out there, that Boris Johnson himself did pull off. Of course, Brexit was a big factor in that, but almost a complete break with the, the May and certainly the Cameron years. Yeah, and the thing about Liz Truss and some of her detractors in Parliament, some of the senior MPs I talk to, is that their concern, they say, is that she is continuity Boris Johnson. And if she doesn't make up the Cabinet differently, run government differently, in which she's more collegiate and she takes uh, more advice and uh, she's more transparent and communicates more with backbenchers, uh, that that continuity Boris Johnson style of approach uh, will not bode well for her with a party that clearly wanted Boris Johnson to leave. I mean, 60 members of his government resigned uh, in protest to try and force him out. So, I mean, someone said to me uh, in July that she was continuity Boris Johnson, but without the charm. That's quite a, a criticism of Liz Truss, I think, but that's, that's what uh, some of them are concerned about, that she will be more of the same and it's not what the public it's not what the public will want. And here it comes. Liz Truss is approaching the gates of Downing Street. The supporters all out here. The rain has stopped. They are gambling. It doesn't return. If it does, we're not talking about a few spits and spots. It is absolute stare odds. But as we were discussing, Beth, there, a new prime minister, any new prime minister elected under whatever circumstances, wants to make that speech outside in front of that famous lacquered black door and set out her stall for the next difficult, well, two years. That's what she says before the next general election. Well, it's going to be a, a difficult two days, to say the, the very least. We await the arrival of Liz Truss. You'll soon hear her supporters. They're turning into Downing Street now. Let's just soak up the atmosphere. Our freshly appointed new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, third Prime Minister in just over three years. Let's listen to her. Good afternoon. I have just accepted Her Majesty the Queen's kind invitation to form a new government. Let me pay tribute to my predecessor. Boris Johnson delivered Brexit, the COVID vaccine, and stood up to Russian aggression. History will see him as a hugely consequential Prime Minister. I'm honoured to take on this responsibility at a vital time for our country. What makes the United Kingdom great is our fundamental belief in freedom, in enterprise and in fair play. Our people have shown grit, courage and determination time and time again. We now face severe global headwinds caused by Russia's appalling war in Ukraine and the aftermath of COVID. 
Now is the time to tackle the issues that are holding Britain back. We need to build roads, homes and broadband faster. We need more investment and great jobs in every town and city across our country. We need to reduce the burden on families and help people get on in life. I know that we have what it takes to tackle those challenges. Of course, it won't be easy, but we can do it. We will transform Britain into an aspiration nation with high paying jobs, safe streets and where everyone everywhere has the opportunities they deserve. I will take action this day and action every day to make it happen. United with our allies, we will stand up for freedom and democracy around the world, recognising that we can't have security at home without having security abroad. As Prime Minister, I will pursue three early priorities. Firstly, I will get Britain working again. I have a bold plan to grow the economy through tax cuts and reform. I will cut taxes to reward hard work and boost business-led growth and investment. I will drive reform in my mission to get the United Kingdom working, building and growing. We'll get spades in the ground to make sure people are not facing unaffordable energy bills and we will also make sure that we are building hospitals, schools, roads and broadband. Secondly, I will deal hands-on with the energy crisis caused by Putin's war. I will take action this week to deal with energy bills and to secure our future energy supply. Thirdly, I will make sure that people can get doctor's appointments and the NHS services they need. We will put our health service on a firm footing. By delivering on the economy, on energy and on the NHS, we will put our nation on the path to long-term success. We shouldn't be daunted by the challenges we face. As strong as the storm may be, I know that the British people are stronger. Our country was built by people who get things done. We have huge reserves of talent, of energy and determination. I am confident that together we can ride out the storm, we can rebuild our economy and we can become the modern, brilliant Britain that I know we can be. This is our vital mission to ensure opportunity and prosperity for all people and future generations. I am determined to deliver. Thank you. Liz Truss, having just taken over from Boris Johnson, posing outside the famous black door with her husband before Are entering the to start work, as she said. Action this day. Are you daunted by the task, Prime Minister? Do you have a plan? So Beth Rigby, our political editor, is with me here. As I was saying there, Beth, we heard from Liz Trust there. Action this day and every day, laying out a stall there. Priority number one, there is this cost of living yeah. crisis. What and do we hear about that? She that she would take action this week. Look, it was a workman-like speech. Uh, it was short. It was sharp as I thought it might be. Uh, and Liz Truss uh, making uh, three pledges to the British people. Firstly, on the economy, uh, she said that she would uh, cut taxes. So still talking about the tax cuts and reform uh, the economy. And wh what she means by that is she wants to deregulate. And what I mean by that is she uh, wants to do supply side reforms. Uh, she'll look at potentially workers' rights. She'll look at uh, regulations on companies. She wants to boost growth and investment. But name checking again those tax cuts. So let's see uh, what she does uh, with that. And then, of course, uh, she said the NHS is her second priority. Oh, sorry, then, sorry, she said that the dealing with the energy crisis was 
her second priority, she would take action this week, she said, to deal with energy bills and secure supply. And what we are going to get is a combination of an immediate package to help with bills over the winter and then a longer term plan about how to secure energy supply. That will be changing some of the market contracts with suppliers uh, to to try and cut bills, but that won't happen until a year, 18 months out. It will be about securing more renewables, but it will also be about oil and gas uh, licenses, using oil and gas in the short term to secure energy supplies, economy transitions to renewables. Now, I'm told that the net green, uh, net zero target by 2050 stands, but uh, put it this way, one of her key allies said, oil and gas producers and production will not be demonised by this government. Some more green Tories might not like that. Talk and to then... me, though, Beth, talk to me about what she was greeted by in there. Of course, Downing Street staff, we saw all her supporters go back inside, but it really is straight to work. Oh, the really announcements is. are going to flow from now on in, well, aren't I they? Think... We're going to find out who's going to be around that Cabinet table. It's going to flow. We're going to get the Cabinet quite quickly, the top positions, because they've all been decided... But look, Dermot, also, she is not massively known with the public. The Conservatives are polling badly and they, she has some severe crises that she has to deal with. Energy bills, and then she name-checked it, her third priority, the NHS. And if she doesn't get this stuff sorted quickly, then she loses her window with the public. Now, normally, typically, a new Prime Minister might get a honeymoon bounce. Theresa May got one, she called an election, didn't go to plan. But normally a Prime Minister might expect a honeymoon bounce as they, they enter uh, number 10 and introduce new policies and new spending plans. But for Liz Truss, she's entering with crises, just crises that she has to deal with. The first one, as she said this week, we expect on Thursday, will be the energy issue. But then she has to sort out the NHS issues because if she doesn't sort out the NHS issues... I think Conservative MPs agree that the public will, will not want to support the Conservatives at the next general election. Just tell me about that energy announcement. I mean, it's going to be so big, it's so important to everything about the Liz Truss project, and she's addressing not just the British people, their hopes and aspirations. International money markets are going to be looking at the precise figures, given how big... Mm -hmm. They are going to be. Do you, do you really think it will be as soon as this Thursday? Because it is so large, you have to get it right. You have one shot. I think what well, I don't know exactly what they're going to announce on Thursday. And I was told, you know, in the early hours of yesterday morning by some of her team and people around her that they haven't finalised the plan. They're still working it through. She has to get in there to, to get her feet under the desk. But what we'll get is a sense of what the plan is and then it will be fleshed out, as I was saying, in a mini-budget uh, later this month. But you are right, these things are market-sensitive because they move the markets, which is why this stuff has to be held so closely. I think the issue is, and you've hit it on the head, there is a narrow path through which she can deal with energy bills and reassure on her longer-term economic plans when she talks about cutting taxes because if you are going to borrow which you'll have to do tens and tens of billions of pounds to fund energy support for businesses and households and then you also say you are going to cut taxes investors get a bit worried about the value of the currency they might have invested in the value of the debt that they might have invested in and what you do not want to do is get the markets jittery i was speaking to someone uh, familiar with the Treasury about this the other day, and I said, is this a pathway to a real economic shock in the country? How worried are you about that as a prospect? And this person said to me that if Liz Trust can do some temporary short-term borrowing plans, almost like the COVID emergency loans and the furlough scheme, but make sure that that is a temporary borrowing uh, with a more fi uh, credible longer-term plan for the economy, that they might be able to sell that to investors and the markets. But, of course, this stuff has to be got right. And it is going to be a big challenge for her to marry up both of those things. And as I said, the tax cuts, she does want to cut taxes. She believes that that will grow the economy, which we know is 
face of a protracted recession if you believe what the Bank of England says. Um, I mean, so she thinks that that tax cuts will promote economic growth. But many economists would disagree with her and, and would say, we think it's the wrong approach. And that, of course, is what Rishi Sunak said. He said, don't cut taxes now until you've got inflation under control because borrowing can just stoke inflation and that has a knock-on effect for the wider economy. And, uh, Beth, do you think the Treasury experience in terms of getting this right, the detail and the stress testing you have to do, we know how long it takes to do a, a plain ordinary budget, so to speak. She has Treasury experience. Of course, she saw it as a demotion at the time by Theresa May. Do, do you think that will, will help? Her Treasury experience? Yeah. I think Liz Truss just... The argument within... Uh, her camp is that Treasury orthodoxy, as they put it, that you don't cut taxes and borrow to grow. Um, they think that that is the wrong approach and she wants to try a different approach. And when I talk to some Conservative MPs, the reason they've backed her is because they think they need a radical approach to try and um, shift the economy. Now, many economists would say it's all very well to talk about long-term growth. Uh, but that can't happen. You can't turn the switch and it comes overnight. It takes years and years and years for those supply-side reforms, as they uh, would call them, to, to feed through into the economy. But again, I'm, I'm interested to see about the sequencing of the announcements, because the tax cuts, she might do them immediately, she might not. It just depends on what the books look like and what they think the markets will bear. OK, Beth, many thanks indeed for the time being, our political editor. Beth Rigby there with her assessment of the, the tasks ahead, the challenges ahead for Liz Truss as Prime Minister. Let's just talk about uh, some of the international reactions. Some of it came in yesterday after Liz Truss was appointed leader of the Conservative Party. Of course, it's only today, after her audience with Her Majesty the Queen, that she has become Prime Minister. We were waiting to hear from the United States. We now have... President Biden has tweeted saying congratulations to Prime Minister Liz Truss. I look forward to deepening the special relationship there, those words mentioned between our countries, and working in close cooperation on global challenges, including continued support for Ukraine as it defends itself against Russian aggression. I want to talk now to Adam Bolton, political commentator, of course, former political editor here with us at Sky News. And let's talk about uh, those international relations now that we've heard from the White House, Adam. And we know they have deep reservations about Downing Street's approach when Boris Johnson was there. And of course, Liz Truss's approach because she was in charge of those negotiations with the EU over the Northern Ireland Protocol. We know the reservations that Joe Biden has about that. We also know about what Liz Truss said about President Macron of France while she was campaigning for the leadership. She has got some bridges to rebuild. Well, she has, but not nearly as many uh, bridges as uh, Boris Johnson, of course, had uh, as far as his relations with international leaders. It was pretty clear he only had one meeting three years uh, uh, with Joe Biden, that the two of them uh, did not see eye to eye. And the Irish issue uh, was very much uh, an issue for an Irish-American president. Now, what's interesting is that on the whole question of the protocol, uh, it does seem as if there's been quite a lot of work going on uh, between officials in Ireland, in the EU and uh, in the UK ahead of this change of prime minister. We do think that Liz Truss will probably go to Ireland fairly soon and certainly people who've been uh, close to this have been telling me that they do think there's a window of opportunity for a settlement in that area. And that certainly would cheer Joe Biden, as would uh, an early demonstration from Liz Truss, which I think we're pretty certain we're going to get, uh, that uh, the United Kingdom is going to continue uh, in its very tough stance uh, against uh, Ukraine and in support of Ukraine against uh, President Putin. Now, uh, Let's just uh, have a quick recap on what Liz Truss actually said when she came uh, into Downing Street, because this was 
her first address to the nation. Uh, it was also, uh, of course, just after the Queen had uh, uh, kissed hands with her 15th Prime Minister. And it was interesting, I think, first of all, in terms of style, very plain Jane, uh, no frills at all, no reference uh, to the fact that she must have known uh, that her audience had been standing in the rain for some time. She got straight into it, very brief tribute to Boris Johnson, saying that uh, his achievements in her view were Brexit, dealing with COVID and Ukraine. Uh, then she talked about the headwinds uh, facing Britain, uh, mentioning particularly uh, the uh, Ukraine conflict. She didn't uh, go into uh, the consequences of Brexit, no surprise there, uh, and uh, talked about the issues which are holding Britain back. And it's very interesting, after 12 years and four Conservative Prime Ministers, the incoming Conservative Prime Minister is still talking talking uh, about the things that are holding Britain back. Uh, and um, probably in the lamest bit of the speech, she talked about turning Britain into an aspiration nation. Well, frankly, uh, that kind of alliteration is uh, padding we've heard so many times before. Then she got down to her key pledges. Uh, she said she was going to get Britain working again. She promised tax cuts and reform and talked particularly about housing, said she was going to get spades in the ground, but also said she was going to get spades in the ground with reference to unaffordable energy. So that seemed to me a nod that she is going to try and press ahead, not only with uh, expanding uh, oil production in the oil and gas production in the North Sea, but also uh, with fracking. That could be fairly controversial. Uh, she then uh, promised that within a week she's going to have a package to deal uh, with the energy crisis. And then, interestingly, she focused on the NHS, saying that she would uh, make sure that everyone could get uh, a doctor's appointment, which, frankly, doesn't sound like a particularly inspiring aspiration uh, for uh, an incoming prime minister, but a lot of people are having real difficulties. And then, finally, this promise to rebuild our economy. Now, Liz Truss then went into Downing Street. She will have been clapped in by the staff and by her supporters. I think we'll get pictures of that. Then she'll be taken into the Cabinet room and briefed by the Cabinet Secretary and briefed by some things of security. And then, of course, the thing which we're all waiting for is to see whether she announces her full cabinet uh, this evening, quite possibly even having a cabinet meeting, although, uh, has to be said, things have been running a little bit behind the given uh, schedule. Let's go now uh, back to Downing Street and Mark Austin. Mark. Yeah, thanks very much uh, indeed, uh, Adam. So Liz Truss is set to get straight down uh, to business after becoming the UK's new Prime Minister. She was expected to give her maiden speech uh, any moment. Uh, well, she was expected uh, to give it, but it was delayed by the weather. Uh, and tonight, as Adam Bolton was saying, uh, she will start appointing her cabinet, top of the agenda, uh, of course, for that cabinet uh, tackling the cost of living and helping uh, vulnerable households uh, through the winter energy crisis. Well, I'm joined now by the Conservative MP Paul Scully, who supported uh, Liz Truss's campaign. Thanks very much indeed for being with us. Uh, two things struck me. She said it wouldn't be easy, which it won't. And the other thing that struck me is how much money she seems uh, to be spending in the early period of her premiership. Well, it's clearly not going to be easy. We know that. And that's why uh, she's right to you know, not be quoting St Francis of Assisi or anything. There's not a moment for that. It's a moment of actually saying, here are the bullet points of what uh, people expect from her and, uh, and our government and uh, that she is going to deliver. And clearly, when you are looking at the uh, situation, as you've been describing, you and other commentators have been describing this afternoon, the scale of it, clearly we've got to um, uh, you know, make sure that we can support individuals and businesses to, um, if we're going to have get to that long-term strategy of growing the economy, showing entrepreneurship and uh, increasing an, uh, energy supply. Right. And uh, could you confirm she's going to um, introduce this uh, freeze 
uh, on uh, energy, the cap on energy at around two thousand five hundred pounds. Is that what your understanding I, is? I can't. I can't confirm that either way. To be fair, it's not my. You know, I've been working with local government, making sure that we get the current support out to people. Um, so we'll have to wait for that announcement. So I can't add anything to that, I'm afraid. But clearly, that, but, but it signifies action. It, sig it does signify the scale of the situation that, we, that we're facing that we need to deliver. But she spoke in her speech about helping uh, people with their energy bills. She then went on to speak about uh, the NHS and how uh, they would be spending for that. And uh, obviously, Boris Johnson has committed to this uh, um, defence spending, 3%, which um, Liz Truss is also saying she's going to stick with. I mean, this is an awful lot of government spending. Something's got to give, hasn't it? And could that be tax cuts? I think what we what we'll see is we're delivering. We're not starting with a blank sheet. We've got a 29, uh, 2019 manifesto to, on which to deliver, and so there's a lot of these things. A lot of these things are already factored in to the uh, Treasury uh, forecast. But clearly, this extra uh, situation of the cost of living, when you're kickstarting the, uh, the the global economy, and obviously exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, we've got to uh, to react, and so that will add extra cost. But Adam Bolton, when he was talking. The NHS, he was a bit disparaging about uh, Liz talking about GP appointments. Actually, it's quite important because obviously at the pressures on the NHS tend to cop, cop up on the, in hospital beds and A&E. And part of that is because people are presenting themselves at A&E because they can't get into their own GP. So it's actually unblocking one of the uh, blockages that in the NHS to, to help relieve hospitals and other, and other pressures there. Yeah, I know my point was, though, that, you know, do you think something will have to give with all this uh, spending? And will social care, you mentioned the NHS, will social care uh, be one of those things that get put back? No, I think, look, the thing, the thing is with uh, Liz talking about tax cuts, looking at, uh, if you're talking about uh, reversing the corporation tax, that makes us more competitive. That makes people want to invest in the UK. If you're looking at uh, some of the other taxes she's been talking about, that helps entrepreneurship, that helps um, the cost of businesses when you're looking at things like business rates and, and, and other taxes that actually allow businesses to start making a profit, i.e. start make it, start paying tax. And that in itself can add to the coffers within the Treasury, which can then be um, spent on public services. But she has obviously said she wants to reverse the national insurance uh, hike. That was due in part to pay for social care. Um, but she still says she's going to pay for social care. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's what, that is one of the extra costs, clearly, because, as I say, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, we, we know there is extra costs. What I'm saying that not all of the tax cuts that she's uh, been talking about and, and reverses are, are, are additional. They, they, you know, some of this is going to factor into the growth and the additional taxes that come into the Treasury. But the national insurance clearly will be an extra cost, and that will be set out uh, in the Treasury figures when the mini-budget is, uh, is announced. And just uh, finally, what about this issue of uh, party unity? Uh, what sort of cabinet do you expect uh, to be announced this evening? Do you want a, a broad bur uh, church cabinet? We want a cabinet that can deliver. We want a cabinet that's got all the talent, the, the best of the talent in there that can actually deliver for people because that's what we'll be judged on. It's, uh, we've gone through eight weeks uh, with some people talking about how popular each of the candidates is going to be in September. Frankly, it's going to be how popular they are in two years' time, and that will only be if Liz and the government delivers. And that's what we've got to crack onto for now, and we need a cabinet that can actually do that. So it's all a cabinet of all the talents is what I'm looking for. OK. Paul Scully, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us uh, this evening. Well, Liz Truss's uh, ascension was confirmed after meeting with the Queen. She travelled from Westminster to Balmoral by plane and then by car after weather conditions prevented a helicopter journey. Uh, she was then asked by the Queen to form a government and was officially appointed as the new Prime Minister. Well, after her return to Downing Street and her first national address, the new Prime Minister is now beginning to appoint members of uh, her new cabinet. Some names have already, of course, been pretty heavily trailed, uh, including her friend and ally, Therese Coffey, who has been tipped to become Health Secretary and uh, Deputy Prime Minister, and who we saw out here front and centre as Liz Truss made her speech uh, this evening. 
and Sam Coates, our deputy political editor, is with us. And I mean, seldom a prime minister uh, enters number 10 as prime minister for the first time with uh, so many crises kind of crowding in on them. That's right, Mark. What was really striking about Liz Truss's remarks, what, barely 25 minutes ago, was that on the one hand, she paid fulsome tribute to Boris Johnson, saying he, would be, he was a consequential prime minister. And then she laid out how the legacy that he has left her is incredibly challenging, how she has, some would argue, the worst, uh, most difficult job in 50, 60 years. Uh, she talked about appalling headwinds. She said up front it wouldn't be easy. Uh, and she said, as strong as the storm may be, I know the British people will get it, uh, get us through it. All of that, in a sense, to manage, uh, in some way, expectations. Because I do think that, I really do think that she is having to lower uh, some expectations. But then she set out three simple priorities. One, to, uh, to deal with energy costs, another uh, to boost the economy, and the third to look after the NHS. It's interesting how the NHS priority has sort of come up the agenda in recent weeks, despite during the middle of the campaign her suggesting she might remove some of the funding, give it to social care. Uh, now dealing with the uh, health crisis appears to be one of her uh, priorities. It just struck me listening to her. It's a very simple speech. There wasn't a lot of rhetoric. Yes, her big tick, you got your, uh, you borrowed a quote from Churchill with action this day, but otherwise it was shorn of the kind of uh, Baroque flummery that you sometimes see on, see on these occasions, perhaps uh, from Boris Johnson, uh, you saw quite a lot of that. But with Liz Truss, very simple priorities. The simple question is how on earth can she afford all of that? Because you've got an energy package likely to top 90 billion. You've got tax cuts uh, that could top 60 billion. You've got markets uh, who are pushing up the cost of the British government borrowing up on a sort of um, uh, reaching new levels uh, today, uh, and you have questions about just where the limit will be and whether if you borrow that amount of money to help with people's energy bills this year, you'd have to do it next year and the year after if Putin is still fighting his effectively his Cold War against yeah, Europe. Yeah, which is the great unknown, how long that lasts. And yet Paul Scully um, was just saying, supporter of Liz Truss, just seemed to be saying that, yes, you know, this spending is going to take place. Yes, I think, I, think there's an, I think the way in which Liz Truss will differ from her predecessors, the way in which she will, in her words, rip up the Treasury orthodoxy, do things differently from the way that George Osborne or uh, Philip Hammond or, or even um, Sajid Javid uh, and, uh, and others, uh, Rishi Sunak, have done it, is that she will, in the first instance, spend, spend, spend. It's a bit weird in some ways because Liz Truss stood for the Tory leadership on a traditional small state uh, kind of low spending ticket. And it was on that that she was elected. But in order to get through the crisis and also in order to do deliver the tax cuts that she's putting at the heart of her plan, very controversial tax cuts, many, many Conservatives, including lots of previous Conservative chancellors, suggesting it might be a bad idea because it'll cost a lot of money, possibly drive up inflation. She, she is just determined, she made clear today, to press ahead with that. It might work or it might cause problems fairly soon down the track. All We're right. just going to have to wait and see. All right, Sam. Well, let's talk to uh, Ian King, our business uh, editor in the city, because uh, this is a very important point that Sam Coates is making there, Ian. What do you make of the spending plans that, on the face of it, uh, seem to be uh, in... We're in store... I mean, what, in the first few weeks of this government? Well, I can tell you what the financial markets think of it, Mark. I mean, Sam Coates gave you a flavour of it uh, just now, but we've seen some very, very dramatic moves indeed this afternoon on the gilt market. That's uh, UK government bonds, UK government IOUs. When the price falls, the yield goes up, and that's the implied borrowing cost for the uh, government. And uh, I can tell you that uh, we've seen some real big landmark moves. For example, the 10-year gilt. Now, the 10-year gilt actually has had its worst one, one month in August since 1986. The yield rose from 1.7%. This afternoon, it hit 3.1%. That's the first time that's happened since July 2011. Likewise, the uh, five-year government guilt, well, that yield hit its highest level since February 2010, when, of course, the Eurozone debt crisis was spilling over. It was just months before David Cameron was elected the head of the coalition government, pledging austerity to try and bring down uh, the deficit and uh, restore order to the public finances. And then the 30-year guilt, well, that's also hit its uh, highest level since 
since March 2020, and that's and for its biggest one-day daily move. So we've seen some really dramatic moves on the gilt market, and what that tells you is that essentially investors are looking for a higher premium in order to take on the risk of lending to the UK government. Why is that? Well, it's mainly because of this talk of this massive package of relief that Liz Truss and her government are going to unveil for households and businesses in response to higher energy prices. Now, there was a lot of speculation in the newspapers this morning that this was going to be funded through some sort of private uh, sector effort, getting the banks to make loans to the energy companies, whereby they would freeze uh, the price of energy. That would uh, force them effectively to trade at a loss. So the government would backstop that. The problem with it is that, the sus that uh, that would be repaid over 15 years via a levy, effectively a tax increase. Well, it looks as though Liz Truss and her government have ruled that out. They're going to go for a straightforward increase in government borrowing. We've heard that could be as much as £100 billion. And I think that's why you're seeing this reaction in the gilt market. Now, does it necessarily Necessarily mean that uh, you're going to get a buyer strike among investors, that uh, the market will stop lending to the UK government? Not necessarily. If you look at uh, overall jet debt to GDP, well, the UK is pretty much in line with uh, some of our main international peers, the likes of the United States and France. So I don't think uh, people are necessarily casting doubt over the government's ability to borrow in the financial markets. But what we've seen this afternoon is that uh, definitely markets are somewhat wary of these big spending pledges, this big increase in public borrowing that is implied by Liz Truss's package to support households and businesses. OK, Ian, thanks very much indeed. Uh, and back to Sam Coates just very briefly, because I understand uh, um, Liz Truss is no longer in here. She's gone to Parliament, is that right? That's right. The first act, not for very long to do all the security briefings, she's gone over to Parliament. That's where you sack people. We are expecting some, particularly Rishi Sunak supporters, Dominic Raab, uh, Steve Barclay, uh, uh, Alok Sharma potentially, uh, could now find themselves out of government. Not really surprised by the list of names of people who will be leaving government, but nevertheless, potentially a painful moment, including for big figures. It's interesting with Dominic Raab. He was another author of that Britannia Unchained book alongside Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Trust uh, uh, back uh, in the early, uh, early 2000s. Uh, he is the one person... Uh, of that group has been cast uh, out, uh, likely to be leaving government despite being Deputy Prime Minister. So that, the sackings, is what's going on over in Parliament across the road. Right, and the, the, the hirings, the sort of Cabinet members, I mean, they'll be coming up here, do we expect, or do you think uh, it'll all be done by phone and get down to business? What do you think? Uh, I think that the tradition of having Cabinet ministers walk up the, the door to Channing Street will probably continue, uh, but Liz Truss will want to do it pretty quickly because she's got the list finalised all... Uh, she had it almost finalised this morning, so why not just show that she's ready and organised and can get on with the business of delivering government by doing the cabinet all this evening? That's what we're uh, being told is, uh, is, uh, is likely. OK, Sam, stay with us. Thanks very much indeed for that. Uh, so after five weeks of uh, waiting for the Conservative leadership contest to end, people across the country will now want to see action from Liz Truss on the biggest challenge of the moment, the cost of living. We're now going to take you up to Warrington and join Sky's chief North of England correspondent,